This video was recorded at Shenanicon. It's the last thing I did before I went to bed that Saturday night. Catching up. Okay, me first. I'm in love. Oh, too much dressing. He's from the Philippines. I know, I know, I'm a rice queen. So how's the writing thingy going? <sighs> Terrible. Wait, but Kitty, I thought you were gonna wait until June to do this. It's June now. Actually, I think the month's like almost over. Oh yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Kitty Monk and I'm here to talk to you about Family Guy. Or more specifically, Brian's cousin Jasper. So, let's discuss. Because I just want to jump right in. Now, let's talk about something. What does it mean to be offensive? I mean, I know I made that whole video on Friday. But I didn't go into detail as to what offensive really means. Typically, I guess it means making making as many people angry as possible, and skirting lines in the process, while also trying to be funny. And you have to walk a very narrow tightrope, because if you don't, you can come off a way you don't intend. Family Guy, I feel, is kind of like a modern day Seinfeld, where at one point it was shocking, and everybody watched it, and it was that show you had to sneak watch, like I did. But at the same time, everybody and their mother copied the show, and now it's not as shocking as it once was. It's just a show that kicked off a trend. Kind of like Rick and Morty. So it makes it easier for critics to rewatch the show and re-examine it and laugh. But it also makes us focus on stuff like their rep. With rep, you guys know that my biggest rule is that the person in question should not always be a saint. Because in real life, even minorities or marginalized groups can be bad people. The important point you need to make is they're bad people in spite spite of the trait they're trying to represent, not because they're from that group. Much like Sal Park, Family Guy tries to be offensive when it comes to rap, and usually I don't mind it, besides criticism. With Ida, I made a whole video about her, where by trying to say she was a person, they also called her a sex offender. But once you get past that episode, Ida can be a good character, albeit too boring at times. Jasper. Not that Jasper. This Jasper. Fudge wrong Jasper. Okay, this Jasper. Are we all on the same page? What Ida is supposed to be for trans viewers, Jasper is meant to be for gay viewers. Now, originally, I was gonna tear Jasper a new hole. But one, he would probably like that. You think it's weird, but this is totally in character. And two, a couple of months ago, although by this point it's probably like a year if not more, I put it up to a vote. And many of you guys said you weren't offended by Jasper, even if you were from the groups he was trying to represent. Kind of like Ida, at worst, you just found him boring. I personally found him annoying as hell, and I remembered him being so offensive. But re-examining the episodes, I kind of get why. Like what they do with Ida, they tend to use Jasper as nothing more than either a way to make as many gay jokes as possible that go on for way too freaking long. Like, oh my god, this dude is more obnoxious than Bruce. At least Bruce has a calmer voice. Or a vehicle to push for forth an admittedly super important message, especially at the time. But whereas with Bruce, I actually feel bad for him, especially because he can't be with the man he loves, with Jasper, well, let's discuss. For reals this time, I actually mean it. Okay. Jasper is Brian's cousin, and I will apologize, I haven't meant to make as many Brian videos or Brian related videos lately because views or stuff like that. It's literally just a coincidence. Like maybe I needed a quick video that week and I was holding off on a character or stuff like that. Or I wanted to talk about this one episode and Brian happened to be a part of it. But anyways, Jasper first appears in the episode E. Peterbus Anum. Oh my god, I hope I said that right. I'll be it during a quick cutaway gag. Look everybody, I got us another dog. What the? Hi, you guys have any cheese doodles? See, that's what I do. I ask for a snack and then I blow the horn. Admittedly, that was a funny joke. Still, that makes me wonder if the cutaway is at all canon. Like, if that means Brian and Jasper really are cousins, as in blood relatives, and that's why Peter decided to buy him. Or if Jasper is from the same farm as Brian and that's what he means. Or if they're cousins the same way Stitch is with the other experiments. Or if perhaps- Kitty, you're looking too deeply into it. Just go on. 
fine, I won't do me yub. But Jasper makes his first proper appearance in the episode Brian Does Hollywood, which makes me wonder if this was always the plan. Like, introduce Jasper early as a cutaway gag and then do a whole episode. Or if he got the Elijah Michelson treatment, where he was only supposed to be in the one quick little short, and then they're like, you know what? He needs his own episode. You guys decide. Brian has made a mess of things back in Quahog, watched the episode The Fin White Line, then he has left the family to go to LA and find himself, living out his dream of being a creative, especially as a director. Unfortunately, nobody will buy his scripts, and the only films he can manage to direct are pornos. There is absolutely no way I would possibly consider doing something like this. Unless I saw a script first. You know, this isn't bad. But eh, at least it's honest work. At least he's directing something. Oh, that's why it's called Brian Does Hollywood. That's clever, guys. During this time, he works odd jobs between films and crashes with his cousin Jasper. Jasper's my cousin. I'm using his place while he's working at Club Med. Jasper returns home with his new boyfriend, Ricardo. Brian! Okay, I'm back. Tell me everything. I'm sitting, I'm hearing. That's Ricardo, Ricardo, Brian. He doesn't speak any English. Can I? Mm, mm. Keep this in mind going forward because Ricardo is the biggest missed opportunity. Obviously, Jasper's not a major character. At most, he's just giving his apartment to Brian. But we do get a feel for his character here. Besides caring very much for his cousin, he's basically a gay stereotype, a gay version of Brian, which isn't that bad on the offset. I mean, we have characters literally called Mr. Slave and Big Gay Al, and they have fans. And in terms of Seth MacFarlane shows, we have Greg and Terry in Memphis, and in the Cleveland show, we also have Terry. But Jasper, unlike them, isn't a funny or well-developed character. He indulges in the family guy trend I like to call the drag on pause, where he says something and then it drags on and pauses and drags on and pauses and drags on and pauses and cut away. And then he drags on a little more and then next scene. Which, he's not the only character who does this. Stewie and Peter do it a lot. But that's not to say this is exclusive to Family Guy. Honestly, for as much as I love American Dad, they tend to do the exact same thing with Roger, where the joke he says will be funny at first, but then he'll just keep talking. You're alive. It doesn't matter where your fish goes. Getting mine to go anywhere at all is a big to-do. Bit of a homebody, my fish likes to stay put. It's like filler. With Jasper, he does the drag on pause with 50 extra words at the top of his lungs and likely night cord on top of that. Five hours on my moneymaker sitting across from a gaggle of sailors. Here I am in a committed relationship and all I can think about is having a piece of navy cake. Hello? Who's that on the phone? Temptation? Oh my god, wait a second. Do I do that? Or so in real life, kitty. I've seen your live streams. You are on my live streams. You're doing it right now. Fudge. The point is, excluding my bit of hypocrisy, it makes Jasper come off as a bit obnoxious, not offensive obnoxious. There is a difference. Even if he's offensive, I can still laugh at him, I can still tolerate him, and want him to succeed. I mean, Big Al is offensive, and I felt so bad he could not be in the Scouts, even if I don't like the lesson at the end of that episode, because I feel like you can apply it in horrible ways. But with obnoxious, it's a bit more difficult to justify, because you don't really like them. You're just annoyed by them. And offensive? I don't even find him that bad. He's just a stereotype and that's it. And he's just the family guy version of a stereotype where he just says loud and proud, I'm a stereotype. Or they'll show him doing something stereotypical. Which, going back to stereotypes, there are ways to do it. I mean, Dale's dad is gay and yet I like him and I feel bad for him. And I'll laugh at his jokes. And with Janet Garrison, I'll laugh at the occasional joke with her, like her rant on evolution, or how she basically leads an entire gay bar who thinks she's crazy. But with Jasper, especially in his main episode, which we'll get to in a couple of minutes, I just keep thinking, 
wow, he's funny. Wait, why are you still talking? Still, there is some good to Jasper, which I wish the show zeroed in on more. And that's how he cares for his cousin. During the whole episode, Brian keeps disappointing people and lying to them. And obviously, this makes quite the impact, as nobody likes his work, but he just keeps digging himself deeper and deeper. Brian goes back to Jasper's one day and finds out he got nominated for a Woody, the adult film equivalent to an Emmy. Strangely, the statues aren't of cute little cowboys like I was expecting. Rats. Eh, at least there are still toys, I presume. Jasper suggests that Brian tell the Griffins he got nominated, and better yet, invite them to the award ceremony. But Brian is hesitant. Come on, call your family. I bet they'll be really proud of you. No, I'd rather they think I'm a jerk than a smut peddler. Brian, they're your family. They'll love you even if you made a couple of crappy movies. Hmm, huh, that's a good point, Jasper. Sucks you can't come. Hey, don't say that. Now, before we get to the Jasper episode, because I refuse to say the whole title unless I have to, and honestly, I think he's kind of like a switch, so the title makes no sense, we should talk about the rep in Seth's other shows. <laughs> Wait, you know what? Hold up. I'll do it next year. Especially Auntie Mama. Until then, I did a video on Greg and Terry. Go watch that. And for Auntie Mama, go watch Lily Simpson's video. She discusses it much better than I can. Anyways, Seb did an interview with Advocate about the rep in his shows, and the subject of Jasper came up. And he said that Jasper was partially based on his own gay cousin, saying, I hope you're prepared for my very gay line of questioning. I spend half the holidays with my gay cousin, so I think I'm good to go. Huh, makes me wonder what his cousin thought about the episode. How did your cousin inform your views? We went to see him in a show when he was in high school or college. And I remember my parents talking about the fact he might be gay and just doesn't know it yet. It turned out they were right. With certain parts of our family, it was taken for granted. Oh, he's gay, and we didn't think any more of it. Other parts of the family were, at times, less enlightened about it. At one point, somebody said, maybe there's a way for him to be cured, which was horrifying to hear from somebody that you love. But I credit my parents for raising me to be a logical person. I went to a very conservative boarding school called Kent, with a lot of Republican students from very wealthy families, and a lot of times that does come with an unfortunate amount of negative traditionalism. So, oddly enough, this guy did not inspire Jasper, or at least the idea of Jasper getting his own episode. It came from Seth's relationships with the other writers. However, this does make me wonder, because he went to a boarding school, was that the inspiration for the episode where Chris goes to the boarding school, and they don't like Chris because he's poor, as in lower middle class? What inspired Family Guy season four gay marriage episode? In which Brian's flamboyant cousin Jasper visits with his Filipino boyfriend. A couple of years prior, I had teamed up to write a pilot with two writers, both of whom were gay. One of them said that when he travels through the Midwest with his partner, they have to go through this dog and pony act. When they stop at a hotel and the guy behind the counter says, you want one room or two? They have this charade where they'll say to each other, is one room okay with you? Yeah, I'm cool with that if you are. Yeah, no big deal. We'll just take one. This was one of my many conversations that I had with them, where I thought to myself, why is it that Johnny Spaghetti Stain in Georgia can knock a woman up, legally be married to her, and then beat the out of her, but these two intelligent, sophisticated writers who have been together for 20 years cannot get married. It's infuriating and idiotic. I'm incredibly passionate about my support for the gay community and what they're dealing with at this current point in time. I have arguments with people where I get red in the face, screaming at the top of my lungs, which I think is a good viewpoint to have, and honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if they inspired Greg and Terry. And as for Greg and Terry, what I found most interesting about them was the episode Lincoln Lover, which talked about the real-life political group the Log Cabin Republicans, who are still strong to this day, who are basically conservatives who happen to be gay or think that being gay isn't a choice and gay couples should have legal rights. And the episode made the point that, yeah, it's not a choice. What? 
but they did choose to be Republicans, not Democrats, as would commonly be accepted. And this allows Stan to convince the RNC to change their viewpoint, because according to Lincoln, the founder of the Republican Party, a house divided cannot stand. I think it helps that with that episode, we also got to know Greg and Terry before the big reveal, because the joke was that Stan just assumed they were like roommates or something, even if they didn't spell it out. And they balanced the joke out with their characters and their relationship pretty well. So it hit really hard when Greg and Terry broke up because Terry found out Greg was a conservative, especially at a time when there were many conservative laws in states that did not want them to get married. But finally, you know what, I'll say the title. We get to, you now may kiss the, um, guy who receives. Which, honestly, I don't get that. They feel like they're switches. Oh, Brian was so thrilled your gay cousin Jasper finally decided to come visit. Well, real subtle, guys. Oh, it's one of them new niche airlines. Wow, real subtle, guys. But honestly, I don't mind that joke. I mean, I don't mind the joke in, uh, Drawn Together about the train. Jasper arrives in Quahog with Ricardo, his boyfriend, who remembers, speaks no English, and hasn't made an attempt to learn any since he moved in. Which sucks. But Jasper promises he has some really big news, and he's going to discuss it over dinner. Anyway, I got big news, and I'll tell you over dinner. Greek. On me. But enough about last weekend. Oh, I'm terrible! You know, I've never had Greek food. I guess it's because there wasn't a lot in my area. I'm weird. Does anybody have any recommendations? But before we get any further, I'll get this out of the way. I think I know the problem I have with Jasper. Or why he doesn't get discussed as often compared to people like Ida. See, a problem with Family Guy is when they try to be serious with characters or do serious messages, the characters they use don't feel like characters. They feel like glorified mouthpieces, while also being vehicles to push forth jokes, which again are usually just stereotypes they just say or show. Like honestly, I get mad nowadays they just explain the joke. They've been doing that like forever. But think about it. In Screams of Silence, Brenda is just a plot device for Crackmire to preach a hypocritical message on. For him to have this dashing male fantasy that he can save his little sister against the big bad Jeff. And they don't do a good balancing act with it like South Park does. Like for example, they never say why Brenda is continuing to stay with Jeff or stayed with him in the first place. Like she can't survive on her own or maybe like Mr. Enner said, Jeff threatened to kill her. Or for Aida, we never saw her agonize over her decision. We were just told, oh yeah, I suffered my whole life and I agonized over this decision. Which makes Glenn's new dislike of Aida come off as more justified, I guess you can say, than the writers were probably intending. As he was given absolutely no warning until a couple of days before the procedure and just told to accept this major change, i.e. accept something he has no clue about or how to handle it. Would you he has no character to start with because he's a stereotype. And as for Ricardo, because he doesn't speak any English, we don't know him personally. We don't know how he feels about Jasper. They don't have any cute nicknames. They never get any actual time together. They don't have any conversations. He's basically a living toy that Jasper gets to screw. He's like Blitz. It if Blitz never talked. But, but the crime dog. I heard you and your little chew toy getting it on last night. Keep it down. Sorry, little man. Ricardo and I were playing Clue and he got me in the bedroom with a lead pipe. And it sucks because the whole episode is about gay marriage and how if two men love each other, they deserve the chance to be together. But it's told rather than shown. Ricardo and Jasper don't seem like they're in love. They just seem like two people who live together and do it constantly. Because I never see them together, so I can't believe it until I'm shown it and I'm never shown it. Nothing they do together goes outside of a joke. Like, I think this is the only time Time they were together. First at the airport, where he basically acts like Jasper's valet, and the second time is at the restaurant. Uh, what's next? A workout followed by a romp around a crowded room while the music goes. <laughs> oh, why'd you stop? Wow, to think this one and Screams of Silence both had restaurant scenes. <laughs> so it's like to me, the viewer, like, argument's sake, say I was 
against gay marriage, and I wanted this episode to convince me otherwise. Why should I care that these two can't get married when all they do is sleep together? Even if they couldn't get married, their life would basically be the same, whether or not they had a ceremony. Granted, I think there is a silver lining to this. Unlike Dylan, those deleted scenes were better off being deleted. Because believe it or not, this episode has a lot of deleted scenes. Ricardo speaks no English, so he has no clue what's going on, even that he was about to be married. <laughs> Enjoy your wedding night. So yeah, good thing you guys got rid of that. Elsewhere, Mayor West donates a statue of Diggum, the sugar smacks frog, to the veterans. The spirit of America is epitomized by his inspiring motto, smack, smack, sugar smack, gimme a smack and I'll smack you back. Dude, I'm not a vet, but I would love that in my town. Mayor Baraka, are you watching my video? Go do that. Regardless, I do have some brief criticism. If it was for veterans, couldn't he have used Captain Crunch? I mean, he has Captain in his name. I assume he did some time in the military, or he's a vet of some kind. The extreme cost of the statue, because that's real gold, and the major cutbacks obviously lead to the townsfolk being angry with Mayor West. At the unveiling, Chris meets Alyssa, a fellow classmate and a young Republican. Have you ever seen such a waste of the taxpayer's money? You're talking to me! This is more exciting than that time me and my friends did mushrooms. Huh, feels weird that they actually intersect here. That couldn't have been a point. But I'm gonna get this out of the way here again. I wish they cut this whole segment with Chris and Alyssa. It doesn't get resolved. It adds like absolutely nothing. Honestly, if you cut out this whole plot point, the episode would be the exact same and it would flow better because we could get more time with Jasper one-on-one. -on -one. All it really does is take away time from a plot line that desperately needed it. At dinner, Jasper continues being Jasper. Lois, darling, those earrings are delicious. Total kitsch, like an Andy Warhol wet dream. I'm opening a museum and putting you in it. They're that fabulous. You think it's clever talking like that, do you? So does he get a dollar for every word he says? And to nobody's surprise, Jasper informs them he's getting married to Ricardo. Yay! The protest against Mayor West continue. And I don't like the contraction apostrophe E-M. As far as I'm concerned, his name is Dig Them. You're not welcome here, Dig Them. Is it bad I remembered this line for like years? Like as in I remembered nothing about this episode but the Dig Them joke? Mayor West feels bad that he's getting negative publicity, so he decides to divert attention away from it by banning gay marriage. Which I guess would be a bad thing. If people were actually shown to be upset about the law besides Brian and Jasper. I mean, Brian and Jasper both mentioned there being a gay brotherhood. Like how are they reacting? We don't even see it as a joke like the Simpsons did. Lewis is told that they're going to have the wedding at the house. Oh, you having the wedding here? Yeah, I hope that's okay, Lois. I offered them the house. Oh, uh, sure. N no problem. Cost effective. However, this makes her begin to wonder, can two men really get married? Oh, what the big deal is, not like we're gonna feed the fish in the living room. You know, maybe I should have talked about the 11-way episode. <laughs> no. Jasper discovers that Mayor West will ban gay marriage. And again, I don't feel bad. Or good. Or anything. I'm just, okay? Like, obviously, it's a bad thing, don't get me wrong. Especially since Mayor West is only doing it as a PR move. But that doesn't mean Jasper's love is essentially forbidden like the episode's making it out to be. I can't believe the wedding's off. All I ever wanted was to get married and make a home with a skinny, hairless Filipino boy. Isn't that the American dream? The ban is only happening in one town. In a very small town. A town that Jasper and Ricardo don't live in, nor are they from, presumably. They never bring up why they can't just go somewhere else. Like a nearby town, or couldn't they just go back to California? I mean, they could have the wedding in the apartment. And I mean, some apartments have backyards. My apartment has a backyard. At least when South Park did follow that egg, Janet wanted gay marriage banned, not just in South Park, but the whole state. Which made the impact a lot worse especially since she only wanted to do it to spite two men. But Jasper is quite disappointed. I thought they'd help my depression. Oh, I can see why. Oh my 
God, they pack so much fudge into these. And look at this, there's even a couple of nuts lodged in there. Oh my God, I just got that joke. Brian decides to help out his cousin by trying to convince Mayor West to veto the bill. Which again, that's another reason I don't like Jasper. He doesn't do anything about this but sulk. He's just like, oh, I'm sad. I'm gonna go in the corner. Call me during the final scene. He doesn't even talk to Brian. Like, Brian, it's a fool's errand. Don't do anything. Or Brian, I'm used to this kind of thing. Me and Ricardo will just go back to California. Like, I thought Brenda was bad. He's just a tool for Brian to fight for. Hey, say what you want about Brenda. At least there was a very real possibility that Jeff could kill her or worse. So I can understand Quagmire's concern for her, even if I don't like it. But what's Jasper's excuse? What does Ricardo think about the fact their wedding will be delayed? What is Jasper doing besides sulking? Why isn't he helping his cousin? Shouldn't he know some people in Quahog? Brian decides to protest by getting a petition in support of gay marriage. Uh, hey, will you sign a petition to overturn Mayor West's ban on gay marriage? You know, I'm sorry, this episode convinced me that petitions do not work, but to his surprise, nobody will sign it. Oh well, what about Herbert? I mean, he did fight against the Nazis in World War II, and the Nazis did a- You get off my property, you pervert. Mm. Lois consults with a priest about the church's official stance and finds out they are against gay marriage. So naturally, because we need another straw man, Lois decides to be against it too. Lois, that's ridiculous. Gay people have every right to get married. Well, they certainly have every right to be together, but marriage should be between a man and a woman. Well, to be fair, Jasper isn't even a human. Do the laws of nature even apply to him in this case? Wait, what about Ricardo? The episode forgot about Ricardo Catherine, therefore I also forgot about him. It's as simple as that. Ryan gets almost enough signatures and he wants Lois to be the 10,000th, but she refuses because of mental gymnastics to cement this fight and because she knows she's gonna lose like oh, come on even peter accepts this she takes stewie and goes to stay with her parents come on stewie we're going to grandma and grandpa's fine i'll go which I did criticize during my worst things Lois has ever done video, but many of you said it was likely so Stewie would not be brainwashed by Brian too late. Or because he's a baby, his mom would still have to take care of him, and I could understand that. But I did rewatch this episode, and I think this does have a nice tie-in. Later that night, Chris burns the petition because Alyssa promised him that if he stopped Brian, he'd get to touch her mommy milkers because that's what you guys call them. They just call them boobs. You idiot! Now I'm gonna have to get 10,000 more signatures before tomorrow morning! What were you thinking? You don't understand, Brian! When was the last time you were even with a woman? But going back to my original point, again, this really adds nothing, because Brian gets all those signatures back in, like, less than a day. So what, really, what was the point? And later we see Chris and Alyssa outside of Mayor West's office, and he doesn't tell her off or anything, nor do they try to stop Brian from going inside. I think I made Brian crazy. Maybe I shouldn't have burned that petition. Oh no, Chris, you did the right thing. It's only a matter of time before Mayor West signs that bill. So it just feels weird. She just says something quick and that's the last we see of her and Chris in the episode. So yeah, that sucks. It went nowhere. Granted, is it just me or was there a scene of Chris getting dumped by her because he tried to support Brian and Alyssa was like, you know what, we're through or something. And then he's like, oh, Alyssa dumped me because I swear that happened. Mandela, he did it again. Mir West is about to sign the bill when suddenly Brian runs in with a security guard trying to stop him in order to show him the petition of 10,000 signatures. Mayor West, you have to look at this. 10,000 signatures. I've been up for 24 hours. I paid off a few people and I did a few things in West. Quahog I'm not proud of. And he doesn't even tell him like, look Mayor West, I did this twice. That's like 20,000 people because then the signature thing would tie in. But Mayor West decides to sign because again, he probably has nothing against gay people. He just wants to distract the public from the dig them scandal. 
Which, Brian, bring that up. Say something like, Mayor West, even if you sign the bill, everybody's gonna remember what you did to that statue. It's staring them down. If you sign that bill, I'm gonna remind everybody. I'll do it right now, even. Well, it's encouraging to know that I'm not the only Mayor West who's facing difficulties. But what I need now is a diversion. Huh. I guess it works so well it fooled even Brian into forgetting. That's clever. You're clever, Adam. Realizing he's not getting anywhere, he holds Mayor West hostage at gunpoint. It should be no biggie for him, considering Adam's night job. I have a tiny bulletproof shield, the exact size of a bullet, somewhere on my body. And if you hit it, I'll be unharmed. At the Peter Schmidt house, Lois finds out about the hostage situation, and her parents are on the side of the gunman. Next thing you know, they'll want to vote. Well, don't you love mom? Come on, Lois, look at her. So two straight people who hate each other have more of a right to be together? That's what we raised you to believe. I should make a video on Babs and Carter and how they should not be together. But you've known your parents all your life. How is this a shock to you? Lois realizes how wrong she was and rushes back home. But first, a joke. A spare key for a Volkswagen Scirocco. They don't even make this anymore. They don't even make this car anymore. Whose key could this possibly be? Chekhov's gun. Meg and Kohawk, the protest isn't going so well, but they're holding up. <laughs> would anyone like to play Stratego? I have Stratego. I would love to play Stratego, mostly because I never have. Can we play Boggle after? I'm really good at that. Lois tells Brian to stop. <laughs> Wait, Lois is the one who tells them to stop? But they should have the right to get married. But you have to come down and give yourself up. If you drag this out any longer, you're only hurting your own cause. I mean, I get it. Lois and Brian are very close, and it brings your character full circle. But it should have been Jasper. I'm telling you, he does nothing. The episode's about him, and he's barely in it. He doesn't lead a protest against Mayor West. He doesn't, like, tell Brian, like, Brian, you need to stop this. You don't have to do all this for me and Ricardo. Like, what is he doing during this time? Probably Ricardo. Ah, good one, Gaffrin. Or maybe he and Ricardo could be on the megaphone and they could make an earnest plea to Mayor West to allow their marriage. Or maybe have Ricardo talk for the first time like, oh my god, Ricardo, I didn't know you spoke English. Well, I learned for you, baby, or something like that. Honestly, I feel like Brenda appeared more in her own episode than Jasper. And she only really got one scene featuring her before Screams of Silence. Jasper needed a chance to shine as something more than a joke, and we never got that before, during, or after this episode. Afterwards, I don't know if they just didn't know what to do, if they just read the fan outrage and didn't know how to respond or were out of ideas, or maybe they had ideas but Bruce was easier to write for because Bruce is basically him done right, but that's a discussion for another day. On the bright side, Mayor West allows Brian to go free because the whole hostage situation situation has distracted the public from the statue scandal, so he drops the charges and allows gay marriage to continue. Jasper and Ricardo have their wedding, Brian gives away Jasper, and Mayor West officiates because... Amazing, all he asked for in return was the key to a Volkswagen Scirocco. You're welcome. Oh, that's good. Now, believe it or not, there was one final time we saw Jasper, in terms of actual substance, and that was... Brian's play. An episode I want to talk about more in depth one day when I eventually do a video on Brian being a horrible writer. Brian has written his own play, The Passing Fancy, which to be fair, the play is not good at all. It's Grant, your new husband. Hi, honey. I've got great news. What is it? First, where do we keep the good scotch? At your brother's house. <laughs> But Brian still got a play he wrote performed. They don't even say how he did it, so unlike Faster Than the Speed of Love, I have to assume it was legitimate. It's still an accomplishment, even if it was bad. Sorry, not gonna demean Brian here, I'm sad to say. And besides, one of my biggest lessons is, even if you write something that's considered bad because of conventional wisdom or by critics, if you have a dedicated fan base, even fans who know that it's flawed and they don't care, Obviously, you're doing something, right? No, I feel terrible. I got you a parka. <laughs> Those two are never on the same page. However, Stewie gets inspired and writes a play in response called An American Marriage. 
Brian reads it, and as is common with most writers, me included, it eats away at the core of his insecurity, like a worm to an apple, and this puts him into a funk. He calls Jasper, who congratulates him on the play, and tells him about Stewie's play. However, he makes it clear he hasn't told Stewie about his feelings yet, and Jasper gives Brian some advice. Does he tell him to be happy, or pretend to be happy, or let it go because Stewie's a baby? Okay, listen to me. Tell Stewie it's awful. It's garbage. Do whatever you have to do, Brian, but never let him know he's got talent. Yeah, you're right. It won't be so hard. Wow, what a D word. And not in a good way. Say what you want about him being obnoxious. I at least liked how he was accepting of other people. How he was the voice of reason. Couldn't he have tried talking Brian down or just told him to lie? Especially considering the stereotype that gay people like the feeder. Couldn't he be more involved in that case? Especially since the way Brian reacts in the rest of the episode is spurned on by Jasper. But after this episode, to this day, Jasper hasn't spoken ever since. He does get cameos, but he's never had a full-on role, which is weird considering how the newer seasons have like a ton of callbacks. Granted, Seth has reused his voice, like for the gay knight in the cavalcade of cartoon comedy, or the mailbox, one of my personal favorites. I think he also uses it for the cow, who I do love because the joke is sweet and simple and to the point, but we haven't had Jasper been in a prominent role. Maybe they were listening to fan criticisms, maybe they just didn't have any ideas, maybe Jasper is a throat ripper for Seth, the same way Stan and Peter are, but it 